welcome back to here am i on a hot hot day on the river i just looked at my phone it said it was 103 i can believe it the water is 84 degrees right now i walked out of the door this morning at daylight and it was already 85 degrees this morning so it's hot but um i wanted to get get back into james we left off in james chapter one um i want to get in james chapter two today and if you want to read along with me let's jump in here but it talks about in james chapter two it talks about a genuine faith it says do not favor the rich it says my brethren have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons? For if there come unto your assembly a man with gold ring and godly apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves? and are become judges of evil, evil things. And what it's saying is, in this chapter, James argues for the necessity of good works. He presents three principles of faith. Number one, commitment is an essential part of, your, of faith. You cannot be a Christian simply by affirming the right doctrines or agreeing with biblical facts. You must commit your mind and heart to Christ. Number two, good works are the natural byproducts of true faith. A genuine, genuine Christian will have a changed life. Number three, faith without good works doesn't do anybody any good. It is useless. These statements are consistent with Paul's teachings that we receive salvation by faith alone. Paul emphasizes the purpose of faith to bring salvation. James emphasizes the results of faith, a changed life. And uh, it talks about in Verse 1, to have respect of persons means to show favoritism to some people over others. Often we treat a well-dressed, impressive-looking person better than someone who looks poor. We do this because we would rather identify with successful people than with apparent failures. The irony, as James reminds us, is that the supposed winners may have gained their impressive lifestyle at our expense. In addition, the rich find it hard to identify with the Lord Jesus who came as a humble servant. Are you easily impressed by status, wealth, or fame? Are you partial to the haves while ignoring the have-nots? This attitude is sinful. God views all people as equals, and if he favors anyone, it is the poor and the powerless. We should follow his example. Amen. Uh, it's talking about in verse 2 through 4. Why is it wrong to judge a person by his economic status status wealth may indicate intelligent wise decisions and hard work on the other hand it may mean only that a person had the good fortune of being born into a wealthy family or it can even be the sign of greed dishonesty or dishonesty or selfishness by honoring someone just because he dresses well we are making his appearance more important than his character we sometimes do this because poverty makes us uncomfortable uncomfortable we don't want to face our responsibility to those that have less than we do we too want to be wealthy and we hope to use the rich person as a means to that end we want the rich person to join our church and help support it financially all these motives are selfish they view neither the rich nor the poor person as a human being in need of fellowship if we say that christ is lord of our lives then we must live as he requires, showing no favoritism in loving people regardless of their circumstances. Also, it's saying we are often partial to the rich because we mistakenly assume that they are rich because they've been blessed by God. But God does not promise earthly rewards or riches. In fact, Christ calls us to be ready to suffer for him and give up everything in order to hold on to eternal life. Um... We will have untold riches in eternity if we demonstrate our faithfulness in our present life. Amen. And there's so many examples of that. You can go back and look in Matthew, Luke, Romans, Timothy. Verse 5. 
Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he had promised to them that love him? Same when James speaks about the poor, he is talking about those who have no money, and also those simple va uh oh Oh, I got a breeze. That feels good. <laughs> so James is speaking about the poor. He is talking about those who have no money and also those who simple values are despised by much of our affluent society. Perhaps they prefer serving to managing human relationships to financial security, peace to power. This does not mean that the poor will automatically go to heaven and the rich to hell. Poor people, however, are usually more aware of their powers, powerlessness, and thus it is usually easier for them to acknowledge their need for salvation. One of the greatest barriers to salvation for the rich is pride. For the poor, it is bitterness. Verse 6. But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do they not blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? Well, I am back at the house. The camera kept overheating. Wouldn't let me finish the video. Luckily, I had looked up at it <laughs> and seen that it had stopped recording. I don't know how long it had been stopped, but anyways, I went back and, and looked, and it looks like I left off in verse 7. It is hot. It is hot. Um, got here in the shade. Try to finish this thing up. Um, so I was in verse 7. I'm going to jump right in to verse 8. It says, If ye fulfill the royal law according to, that, to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. It's saying there in verse 8, The royal or sovereign law is the law of our great King Jesus Christ, who said, Love one another as I have loved you. This law originally summarized in Leviticus 19.18 is reinforced by Christ in Matthew 22.37-40 and is also taught by Paul in Romans 13.8 and Galatians 5.14. It says, we must treat all people as we would want to be treated. We should not ignore the rich because then we would be withholding our love. But we must not favor them for what they can do for us while ignoring the poor. Who can offer us seemingly so little in return? Verse 9, but if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin or convince the law as transgressors. Verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, also said, or said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Verse 10 is saying, Christians must not use the verse to justify sinning. We dare not say, because I can't keep every demand of God, why even try? James reminds us that if we've broken just one law, we are sinners. We can't decide to keep part of God's law and ignore the rest. You can't break the law a little bit. If you have broken it at all, you need Christ to pay for your sin. Measure yourself, not someone else, against God's standards. Ask for forgiveness where you need it, and then renew your effort to put your faith into practice. Amen. Saying in verse 12, as Christians, we are saved by God's free gift, which is grace through faith, not by keeping the law. But as Christians, we are also required to obey Christ. The Apostle Paul taught that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You can see that in 2 Corinthians 5.10 for our conduct. God's grace does not cancel our duty to obey Him. It gives obedience a new basis. The law is no longer an external set of rules, 
but it is a law of liberty, one we joyful and willingly carry out because we love God and have the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Saying in verse 13, only God in his mercy can forgive our sins. We can't earn forgiveness by forgiving others. But when we withhold forgiveness from others after having received it ourselves, it shows we don't understand or appreciate God's mercies towards us. We see that in Matthew six fourteen through 15 and Ephesians four thirty one through 32. Uh, verse 14 is talking about faith results in good works. 14 says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warned and filled, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? prophet even so faith if it hath not works is dead being alone yea a man may say thou hast faith and i have works show me thy faith without thy works and i will show thee my faith by my works thou believest that there is one god and doest well the devils also believe and tremble but wilt thou know o vain man that faith without works is dead was not Abram our father, Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called, by the, fr called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Amen. Um, verse 14 is saying intellectual assent agreement with a set of Christian teachings is com incomplete faith. True faith transforms our conduct as well as our thoughts. If our lives remain unchanged, we don't truly believe the truths we claim to believe. Verse 17, we cannot earn our way into heaven by serving and obeying God, but such works show that our commitment to God is real. Works of loving service are not a substitute for but a verification of our faith in Christ. And it's so funny, I was um, loaded the boat up a while ago and I was pulling out of the boat ramp and a preacher was on the radio and he was talking basically on the same thing. It's, it's, it's crazy how, how the Lord will open up stuff to you like that if, if you just listen, if you'll be obedient. But he, he was saying, the preacher was saying, um we have you ever have you yourself or you ever know somebody that was just all in for for Jesus? I mean they was they was at church every Sunday, every Wednesday night, they was at revivals, they was at church singings, and all of a sudden something happened in their life and then they just I don't need to go to church. I don't need to go to church. But yet when they was going to church, they was trying to invite people to church and they wouldn't miss church for nothing in the world. And once you get out of that loop, Satan is nipping at you. you one Sunday, this is what, what he was talking about, and I've been there, been there myself. Uh, one Sunday missing church can lead to another Sunday. And to a Wednesday, and to another Sunday missing church. And before you know it, you look back and you're two years out of church. And your your testimony is wrecked again. You know, it's Satan is that powerful. But he was saying, if you will stay in this book and reading in this book, in the Bible. 
It will help keep your feet planted. It's all you got. You've got to stay in the Word. Staying in the Word will keep you wanting to go to church to learn more. It'll keep you wanting to pray more. It'll keep you wanting to witness to people more. Just going and sitting in church is not enough. You, you can't just go sit in church and shake the preacher's hand. Well, all right, I appreciate it. That was a good message. We'll see you next Sunday. There's more to it than that. And that's what this is talking about. You should, when you're, when you're saved, when, when you're trying to walk Christ-like as a Christian, you should want to do all this, all this in the Bible that it says. You should want to go to church to be around other Christians and, and help build each other up and iron sharpeneth iron. And man, it, it just really, really hit home with me. Because I can remember a time in my life where I let the worldly things, and you know who who rules the world? Satan himself. He said, don't put up your treasures here on earth. Put them up in heaven. Um, it all looks good down here. The ski boats, the lake, fishing, hunting. There's always something to catch us. You got basketball season, then you got baseball season, then football's right around the corner. And before you know it, you're caught up in all that, and you're you're up on Saturday night. Well, I stayed up late. I don't. I I'll, I'll go to church next Sunday. And that's how you fall in that trap. I've been there, done it, done it multiple times, multiple times. But staying in this word will help you more than anything. Help you more than anything. Um. I just talked about verse 17, talking about we cannot earn our way into heaven. Uh, verse 18 talks about at first glance, this verse seems to contradict Romans 3.28. A man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Deeper investigation, however, shows that the teaching of James and Paul are not at odds. While it is true that our good works can never earn salvation, true faith always results in a changed life and good works. Paul speaks against those who try to be saved by works instead of true faith. James speaks against those who confuse mere intellectual assent, assent with true faith. After all, even demons know who Jesus is, but they don't obey him. True faith involves a commitment of your whole self to God. Uh, verse 21 through 24 is talking about James says Abraham was justified declared righteous because of what he did. And Paul says he was just justified because of what he believed in Romans 4, 1 through 5. James and Paul are not contradicting but complete, uh, complementing each other. Belief brings us salvation. Active obedience demonstrates that our belief is genuine. Verse 25 is talking about Rahab lived in Jericho, a city the Israelites conquered as they entered the promised land in Joshua 2. When Israel's spies came to the city, she hid them and helped them escape. In the way, in this way, she demonstrated faith in God's purpose for Israel. As a result, she and her family were saved when the city was destroyed. You see that in Hebrews 11:31. It lists Rahab among the heroes of faith. Amen. These verses just they really, really, really hit home to me. It really hit home to me. And if we would just live live this life, it's easy. It's easy. You just got to do it. Believe. Have faith. Read your Bible. Get out of the the groups that's dragging you down. You may need to may need to make new friends. Hang out with people that build you up rather than tear you down. Read your Bible. Pray. That's all we can do. Just believe. In chapter 3 coming up is a good one. It's talking about controlling the tongue. tongue. This is going to be a good one. 
but I hope y'all got something out of it. Um, love your brethren, poor or rich. Don't just love the rich because they'll get you, get you into places. <laughs> so, but I, I, I really enjoyed this one. And then that preacher coming on, it just, it really hit home to me. Going down the road, just jaw drop, shouting, just one of those God moments that God just puts it all together. That preacher could have been preaching on anything in the Bible. There's a lot of it to preach on. You can preach a whole day on one verse. But for him to be talking about that, it, it, it's amazing. Amazing. Ain't nothing we can do to get in heaven. Not by works. But only believing in Jesus Christ. Believing in Him. And then by believing in Him and reading the book, it'll make you want to be a changed person. I've said it before, it's not easy being a, a Christian in this world. We're, we're aliens in this world. It's not easy. There's so many temptations all around you. And if you've lived that life, if you've lived that worldly lifestyle before, and then you you got to cut it off, and you're trying to walk as Christ-like as you can being a Christian and trying to do what's right, it's hard. The devil knows exactly where, where to poke and pride you at. He knows exactly the things that you love, the things that you miss. He knows where to get you at. He knows where to get me at. Old country music used to really, really, that was my country music and old country music. I like the old Waylon Jennings, Mickey Gilly. Them rock, classic rock, Bob Seger, Allman Brothers, Fleetwood Mac. I mean, that's how I roll. I'd get on my Harley Davidson, turn my music up loud as it'd go. Some nights I looked down and my speedometer had 120 on it. And I'd see how, how deep it would bury down there where it said Made in USA. Running wild. Did not care. But thank God he gave me another chance. <laughs> thank God he gave me another chance. I should be I should be a cross on the side of the road somewhere. And that's what I, I look at and look back. I know that. And it's it's made me want to speak out now because I've seen that the only, only reason I'm here is because of the good Lord and, and I'm supposed to do something. You know, you've heard people say, man, you lucky. The Lord, Lord's done saved you so many times from accidents. You, you meant to be here. Well, if you meant to be here, do something. If you, what, what, do you got, what are you meant to be here for? Do something. Be a light in somebody's life. I could talk on this all day long, but I probably bored y'all enough. We'll get on uh, chapter three next and uh, roll with it. Thank y'all for tuning in. Wish I could have had some good fish to show y'all. Um, it was miserable out there. I got a couple good hits, and that was it. Uh, I went and tried, tried to start tr trolling for strike. Didn't have any luck doing that. All the fish are deep. Deep down there where it's cool. Too hot. See y'all again next time. Y'all be good. Stay blessed. Have a good one. Until next time. <laughs>